This lecture is taken from chapter one from the textbook, Nutrition Revolution. This first chapter is called The Origins of Our Current Nutritional Practices. Since the beginning of the 20th century, we've been exposed to an unprecedented change to our food supply. The abundance of processed foods high in salt, sugar, and fat is making us sick. The rather poor quality foods from which we feed ourselves and our children are creating increased risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and some cancers. The association between disease and diet is so powerful that epidemiologists have been able to establish that dietary habits are associated with about 59% of cancer deaths in women and up to 45% in men. Nutrition has become the main focal point of preventative health care currently being promoted in the United States, Canada, Europe and Japan. The goal is to embrace more wholesome dietary habits for the love of our families and children. It probably makes sense to begin with an examination of the origins of our current nutrition practices so that we can understand a bit of the history of how the food supply changed since the beginning of the 20th century so that we may be more able to implement changes for our future for the benefit of our families and of our children. We certainly live in a society that demands peak performance and is in fact intolerant to anything that's not on the fringes of excellence. Peter and Waterman back in the 1980s introduced the notion of searching for excellence among American companies nearly four decades ago with their bestseller In Search of Excellence. And still, it's strongly embedded in the North American psyche. It's all about people being excellent at what they do. We've become, in fact, a culture intolerant to mediocrity when quality can be achieved. And we buy into the idea of always being at the peak level of performance, of grabbing every opportunity and seizing the day. It's a wonderful vision that leaves no room for being tired, unfocused and moody. The solution is an arsenal of antidepressants to deal with the unruly, undesirable doldrums that make up unpredictability. Additionally, we depend on a diet that maximizes energy, endurance, and keeps us capable of responding at whatever is thrown at us. In fact, nutrition and lifestyle have become the most recognizable icons for preventative medicine. Epidemiological research has been able to make very strong associations between the obesity epidemic and heart disease, type 2 diabetes, cancers, and depression. So we are learning that we have a vested interest in improving the ways we eat and in the ways we feed our children. For if we fail to improve our dietary habits and improve our food supply, we're looking at putting our children on a path of chronic disease from which they could never escape. To better understand American food habits, we have to go back to the arrival of the Puritans who sailed from England on the Mayflower. These pilgrims arrived at Cape Cod in 1620 and introduced New England to the British Yeoman Diet, which consisted of wheat and barley, rye. Rye was replaced by maize in the earlier years as it was a native crop. We had also pulses, which are beans, beef, pork, mutton, dairy, butter and cheese was included in there, and fruits. Looking at the slide right now, you can see that a lot of the foods that are there, in fact, almost all of them, um, have a very important place on the food guide that we currently follow for healthy eating guidelines. What you might notice from this slide is almost the entirety of the food inventory is actually coming from within the home or around the home. So the homes are basically self-sufficient probably less than 5% of the ingredients making up the food inventory of the house is coming from the local store. So as a whole, we could say that the yeoman diet that was introduced by the Puritans in the 17th century was really just minimally processed. So then finally, after that first 
wave of immigration from the Puritans, we see the second wave of immigration from Northern Europe in uh, the 1800s. And it involves mostly England, Scotland, Ireland, Scandinavia, and Germany. And they bring with them a, div a diversified diet, of course, that enriched uh, the already wholesome and nutritious diet brought forth um, by the Puritans. This became even more apparent once the native Indian traditions were starting also to um, integrate the culture, the food culture of the um, immigrants that were now populating the United States. So now we saw a really a diversified diet that was still, for the most part, minimally processed. By the time the third wave of immigration began around 1870, um, with the Italians, with Poland, Russia, Hungary, Japan, Mexico, and with Canada populating the northern uh, states of the U.S., uh, we see occurring at the same time the beginnings, if you will, of the Industrial Revolution, and we see the mechanization uh, and the processing of food starting to increase quite significantly during this time period. In fact, during the early part of the uh, 19th century, uh, the nation's population was expanding in unprecedented ways, increasing from 10 million in 1820 to 17 million by 1840. The 70% jump in the population was impressive, with 6% moving west to Illinois and Iowa, but a significant proportion remaining in the Atlantic coast, roughly 94% of the increase, and a large faction gravitating towards the cities, vying for the much coveted factory jobs. So then as the urban centers were expanding and newly expanding with great numbers of people migrating to these cities, it was in this context that the modernization of the food supply really began. So in this context, the American household was changing rapidly at the turn of the 19th century. It transitioned from a production unit, 85% of manufactured foods were generated from within the household in roughly 1800, to a purchasing unit by 1830 with furniture, clothes, and food primarily bought outside the home. This dramatic decline in the household self-sufficiency within a generation translated into a more commercial dependence on food. For instance, between 1850 and 1900, the number of commercial bakeries increased 700%, causing homemade bread to drop from 80 to a mere 6% of all breads produced in the US. The United States, in fact, developed a love affair with white bread. The sudden availability of white flour in the marketplace favored household transition from rye, corn, and wheat and whole wheat based flatbreads to fluffy white yeast raised breads. The wheat kernel was now separated more thoroughly into the endosperm, the germ, and the bran. This occurred because roller mills replaced stone mills, thereby creating nutritionally impoverished flour that had also lost its familiar nutty flavor. We can say that the first most significant and impactful change that occurred with the Industrial Revolution was the use of mechanized milling that impoverished our wheat supply. Fueled by Sylvester Graham's writings and speeches, the health reform movement by the 1830s was decrying the modernization of the food supply. Graham, in his treatise on bread and bread making, encouraged his readers to purchase the best unrefined flour, which he insisted they needed to grind up themselves in order to make homemade bread baked in their own ovens. In a time of vanishing self-sufficiency, writes Stephen Nissenbaum, it was a call to return to traditional bread making that fell pretty much on deaf ears. Aaron Bobrow Strain, in his book Kills the Body Twelve Ways, he writes, in an age obsessed with concerns about purity, hygiene, and sanitation, 
The new loaves were engineered to appear streamlined, sparkling clean, and whiter than white. After decades of enduring a reputation for filth, contamination, and foot dragging around pure food legislation, commercial bakers had turned purity into the greatest selling point. On the sidelines, Tonsonianism, the most important and significant of the health reform movements originating in the United States, critically lashed out at the new American tradition of eating around a lavish and richly adorned dinner table with abundant meat, sauces, and side dishes. Overweight Americans were already beginning to surface, and so the health reform movement was attempting to awaken the public's awareness of the dangers of overindulging in rich foods and alcohol. Thompsonianism was founded by Samuel Thompson in the 1820s and was also known as the Thompsonian Botanical Movement. It was a popular alternative form of medicine unique to the United States until the Civil War in 1861 to 65. It promoted diet, herbs, and food as central components to good health and was a movement born in opposition to the modernization of medicine and diet. It would eventually evolve to include hydropathy and homeopathy, uh, which came primarily from Europe. Samuel Thompson was a farmer, an amateur of medicine, and a zealous critic of institutionalized medicine, who called for a return to pre-modern day medical healing practices and food processing. Medicine, as profession, protected by licensure, began to more normally emerge or formally emerge in the U.S. with English-trained physicians founding by the 1700s formal medical schools. It was from these institutions that American doctors of medicine graduated and began opening up medical practices in large northern cities like Philadelphia, New York. These kinds of doctors continued, however, to embrace the old European medical theories and practices that had been steeped for so long in stagnation and ignorance. They continued to awkwardly tackle inflammation and fevers with practices of bloodletting and mercury-based laxatives. There was, in fact, very little evidence that these physicians were able to successfully treat disease or assist in childbirths. Yet, despite their visible incompetence, it was this exclusive licensure of medical practitioners that consolidated their hold on the broad field of medicine, causing orthopedic doctors, midwives, Indian doctors, and herbalists to be forcibly reclassified as non-doctors or quacks in many of their treatments, and many of their treatments forbidden by law. Now, this is precisely what Thompsonianism was decrying as a tragedy, as the movement believed very strongly that the plants contained true medicinal components and that the standard physician did not consider their practices. Moreover, cholera epidemic that was raging in large American cities by the mid-19th century killed thousands of people despite the application of standard medical therapies. It's not surprising then that the field of medicine was facing quite an uphill battle to gain credibility. So it's in this context that dietary practices rooted in vegetarianism became the central theme of his therapy. He strongly advocated for the individual to take control of his health by embracing healthy lifestyles and good food habits. Thompsonianism in its heyday, lasting between 1822 and 1850, was a movement that was trying to guide the American diet back to a simpler and possibly healthier time period, which began with the arrival of the Puritans who sailed from England on the Mayflower. In the 20th century, the interest in nutrition, uh, because of the vitamin revolution, we had nutritionists like Adele Davis writing about achieving optimal health. Uh, nutrition was perceived truly as a panacea and in the process, the physician's role as sole healthcare provider was actually being put into question. So in the earlier part of the 20th century, the interest then in nutrition was high as malnutrition was actually rampant around the US. 
Experts now believe that uh, because Americans were consuming over 50% of their calories from white bread by the 1930s, a consequence of the 1917 war uh, rationing habits combined with the Great Depression's cheap food budgeting, that malnutrition became prominent problems in the U.S., the white flour was so heavily processed around 1911, the consequence of the roller mills and the bleach treatments that no nutrient in the flour could survive. And so white bread purchased in the stores could not be considered a food in the strict sense. As early as the 1920s, there was some suspicion among the food reformists that something wasn't right. Benjamin R. Jacobs, a nutritional biochemist who worked for the Bureau of Chemistry, which came under the control of the USDA, began to document the adulteration of flour around 1906 and became a strong advocate for strict controls under the Pure Food and Drug Act. Then by the 1920s, he recorded the loss of nutrients in flour processing and began experimenting on methods of enrichment. As early as 1910, Harvey Wiley, the head of the Food and Drug Administration, fought ardently against the practice of bleaching flour, a process method, a processing method that utilized nitrogen trichloride. Even after he successfully got the practice of bleaching uh, flour banned by a Supreme Court decision in around 1911, Dr. Wiley was ousted from his position in 1912. The ban on bleaching was then bypassed by an overriding administrative decision. Dr. Wiley later described the bleached flour in a 1914 issue of Good Housekeeping as white and waxy as the face on a corpse, according to an article published in 1954. Nitrogen trichloride was used in flour right up until 1948 when British nutritionist Lord Mallonby conducted a series of well-controlled experiments on dogs in which running fits of epilepsy-like behaviors were noted in dogs fed trichloride bleach bread. These same kinds of experiments were actually um, redone here in the United States on a variety of animals and found to concur with Lord Mallonby's findings. The FDA then banned the nitrogen trichloride as a bleaching agent after 40 years of use. Not long after, despite protests uh, by U.S. Army nutritionists, the FDA approved chlorine dioxide as a new bleaching agent. It's surprising that despite the Supreme Court ban on bleach back in 1911, the practice of bleaching flour still continued and is currently permitted today. So here are a few insights to consider as you continue the reading of chapter one. First, the food pyramid and the my plate models of food guides have really strong historical origins. Read more about the history of the food guides in your chapter. Know as well that they're based on a principle and knowledge of vitaminology, that there are indeed water-soluble vitamins like vitamin C or ascorbic acid, and a complex of B vitamins. And these requirements for uh, water-soluble vitamins are daily. Then you've got the fat-soluble vitamins, such as vitamin A, D, E, and K. And these vitamins, because they're fat-soluble, are less uh, are not as required as often, uh, and consequently have weekly or monthly requirements depending on the person's requirements or needs. The second set of insights has to do with the rising prevalence of chronic disease in the U.S. during the 20th century, specifically uh, from the mid 20th century on, devastating essentially our healthcare system. And the realization, of course, during that time period, especially by the 60s and 70s, that it really cost less to prevent than to cure a disease. And that became, of course, the fuel towards the preventative medicine approach. By the 1970s, traditional medicines, magic bullet treatments were beginning to be suspect as alternative medicine advocated for a more holistic approach to treating patients, reintroducing, as it were, pre-modern medical therapies such as homeopathy, acupuncture, acupressure, and introducing an assortment of calorie-restricted diets to address the growing girth of Americans. 
who are now suffering from heart disease and diabetes in greater numbers. The physician's status as a sole healthcare provider is basically challenged in this context as the individual is progressively persuaded of the viability of managing his own health through better diet and lifestyle. The reason appears to be primarily tied to the medical field's mismanagement of antibiotics. Indeed, evidence now emerges that methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA infections, once limited to hospitals, is now growing in frequency at the community level. Antibiotic-resistant bacteria represent a growing threat as these bugs can quickly circumvent antibiotics and potentially override and compromise a biological system, thus leading to death. Now what we see are practitioners of alternative medicine talking about eating well and exercising in order to boost the immune system and they're trying to limit rather than encourage the use of antibiotics. Now while the prevalence of obesity and heart disease and diabetes are increasing, patients are now more frequently appearing complaining of fatigue, back and joint pains, insomnia, sleep apnea, heartburn, migraines and difficult digestions. The pathogenicity of these conditions is less clear and not really easy to resolve with magic bullet strategies. According to the National Institute of Health 1992 statistics, digestive disorders represent 13% of all hospitalizations and 87 billion US in direct medical costs per year. Is it the stress of the workplace, of family responsibilities, the lack of sleep and exercise, and in many instances deplorable dietary habits that are really identified as the culprit? The MD, who generally tends to have no more than 48 hours of nutrition in a five-year medical program, often is limited to dealing with symptoms, but not the underlying cause. It makes sense, given that medical training has always been geared towards treating injuries and disease. Practically speaking, this means that if a worker accidentally cuts his finger off in a work-related accident, he's not thinking naturopath or spiritual healing, but more hospital emergency ward and critical care physician. On issues of general health, however, some of the public has tended to no longer solely gravitate around the traditional medical practitioner, but rather to embrace alternative medicine practices that speak the language of spiritual and holistic well-being. These doctors of natural medicine purport to have a mastery of nutrition and the knowledge to unlock the healing powers of many food components of our diet. In this way, diet prescriptions can be tailored to somehow maximize human health and therefore human performance in all facets of life. Do these approaches that are holistic represent a true challenge to traditional medicine? Only time will tell. But one thing is certain, we are experiencing a shift in healthcare paradigm that is guided by the very pragmatism of preventative medicine. And nutrition is indeed where the hub of activity is actually taking place. Is this the road less traveled that only a few dare to follow because it demands a commitment to change behavior and lifestyle? Few, it appears, are willing or even able to disentangle themselves from the web of addictive foods that many have come to love. In the landscape, a golden path seemingly beckons us to follow this road to better health that demands from us the willingness to consume foods that are unprocessed and organic. 